I want to talk about why this is hidden in plain sight. And I've been working on this for a long time, and I've gone around the world, and I've seen perfect people like Somali, and they've shared their story, and it's been really sad. It's so sad to carry all that pain. But I'm coming to the conclusion, and I want to suggest to you that this is not happening because some people on the planet are evil. Some people are evil, and we need to fight them. This is happening because we are all human, and we all need basic human rights. Being human is to have within us both good and evil. Being human is to each be shaped by our past experiences. That becomes our identity in our present, and that dictates our choices in our future. Trafficking and enslavement is a systemic response to something systemic going on, going wrong on our planet. It's creating many victims, and the impact of it, the byproduct almost, feels so evil to that victim that we are misguidedly focusing on looking for evil to punish evil. We're looking for the negative instead of inspiring ourselves to the positive. And we're the buck stops here generation. We are the first generation to be leaving this world a worse place for our offspring. We're leaving them to find the solutions that we failed to innovate. That's heavy stuff. It's not easy when your kid turns around and says, Mommy, why did you guys eat all the fish? Trafficking and enslavement has always been talked about as getting a foothold within cultural patterns, sexual liberation in the West, apprenticeship system in Africa, debt bondage in India. The problem is not that. The problem is that we're all in utter denial. We cannot see our own culture. We're really awesome at seeing it in other people's there. Imagine how stressful poverty is. What does the stress of anything make us do? It shifts us into fight or flight. And I think that's what we're seeing. Massive flight, unprecedented migration of people, a massive escalation in crime. Fight, fight back any way you can. If you have a photo of your child on you, I want you to get out that photo. There's a lot of young people here, I notice, so snuggle up to somebody who's got a kid if you don't have one. And I want you to really imagine that a doctor tells you at lunch that your child needs a heart transplant in the next week or they're going to die. And let that sink in. And then someone tells you at dinner, oh, um, well, by the way, did you know that you could buy a child out of poverty for about $300? It's called the trafficking of organs. What would you do? I'm a parent. Are you sure that you would be strong and do the right thing? Or when you are under stress, does your fight emerge and do your morals falter? Scientists are starting to call this the Lucifer effect. So I go to see child slavery. I go to look for examples. And I'm expecting that I'm going to be able to find it. And it's hidden, I'm told. Um, but it's as complicated as getting on a plane and going to Ghana and getting in a bus and going for a long bus ride and meeting the elders and walking to the lake, and there it is, it's the fishing scene. And I'll be honest, as I'm walking to the lake, this happens to me all the time, I've got this little committee going on in the head, there's like four of me talking while I'm trying to focus on what I'm doing, and one of them's saying, God, it's really hot, and the other's like, we came a long way, we're doing a good thing, and... And everybody, all of them are kind of going, now, don't expect to see any change, because Kevin Bell's told us it's not going to be change. You're not going to see change. You're not going to see it's psychological. And for once, I get to the lake, and I'm looking at this, and there's this silence. And all four of them go, where are the chains? It's like my mind can't shift to, I'm not going to see it. I'm still expecting to see it. And I say to the NGO that I'm working with, what am I, what am I, I'm sorry, I, I, tell me what I'm looking at, because it, just, it just doesn't look that bad. And what they say to me, and I'm looking at this scene here, 
they're telling me I'm looking at child slavery. And I say, but, but, the, but you're telling me that boy there, I mean, and part of me is saying, I'm expecting him to be emaciated. And he looks really healthy. He looks like he's having three meals a day. From their perspective, they say, yes, but look at his height. He's about 12 years old, and he's built like a man. That tells us he's been doing about five years of hard labor. That's what we're looking for, but it's certainly not what I'm expecting to see. So why did this happen? Lake Falter is the second largest man-made lake in the world. And the intention behind building it was to give people fish, was to give people something good. But when they did it in practice, they forgot to clear the trees. So all of the nets get caught in the trees, so they end up with child slavery so that they can untangle the net. So was it evil in intention? No, but its byproduct was evil. I went to see solutions in the field. I went to work with NGOs. What was ironic to me was I was invited to go do this. I was, I was saying, I want you to connect with us by Milan Vivere, who I would go to the Kennedy Center in DC to do events for Vital Voices. And I said, I can't see how I'm connected. I can't see. So she said, go and find it. You'll see the connection. This is not a guy from the NGO. This is the first suspected trafficker that I meet. And he's young, and he's full of hope. And look at his T-shirt. Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. He said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So why is this so hard for us to see? Scientists are saying it's because of our brain. We, th we think our brain is this perfect machine that delivers to us the, the, the entirety of truth, the entirety of an experience, but actually our brain is fantastically selective. We don't notice incremental change. It shifts us into different responses. If we focus too much on something, we miss something altogether. We're not experiencing truth. And part of that feeds into our culture. If our brain is a result of our former experiences, that's how we perceive the world. So how does, why does culture breed denial, and how does denial prevent us from getting there? Because we come to everything with our perspectives. We don't realize it's just a perspective. We think it's all there is. I was on holiday with my sister. We were skiing, and she'd gone off with some guy, and he says, oh, I love your accent. It's really, it's really great. You want to go to the beach? She said, I don't have an accent. You do. I then take that story to go and order my cheeseburger, and the guy says, American or Swiss? And I said, I'm English. He said, I want to know what cheese you want on your... We're, we're all missing. And I moved from the UK to the US, and people can't describe where the lift is to me because they call it an elevator. And I can't buy from the supermarket bin liners for my rubbish because they call those trash bags for trash. And someone was kind enough to help me and listen, and suggest I try the pharmacy, and I had no idea what he meant because we call it the chemist. And an eraser in the US is a rubber in the UK, and a rubber in the US is a condom. And I won't even go there with how many people I have shocked by asking, I'm exhausted, can I bum a fag of you? I have been talking, taking one of the smartest people I've ever met, James Zukin from Hulihan Luki, through issue. And he's from the financial world and he engages government. And he listens and then he says, what if we go to the IFC and WB? I almost lost it. I was like, what on earth has the independent film channel got to do with Warner Brothers? We presume we're sophisticated, but actually we're only experiencing fragments of the truth. And a great deal is miscommunicated, even within the same language. When we start to translate, we kick it up the potential to misunderstand to dangerous degrees. When Khrushchev banged his heel on the podium at the UN and he said, we will bury you, I've heard more than one Russian say, we mistranslated it. He was saying, in terms of our political philosophy, we will outlive you. 
he was saying our, politi our political philosophy will leave you in the dust. And that kicked off for us in terror that we were going to be annihilated, the Cold War. The Russians are very passionate people, but as a child, I, I grew up thinking they were cold. Well, they're only cold in the sense that it's blooming freezing in Moscow sometimes, but we think differently to them. And I think that when Khrushchev turned up in Cuba with missiles, it's just possible that he wasn't ever going to bomb the US. He was saying, I cannot get through to you how it feels to have bombs pointed at my country, at my people, which is what you have in Turkey. So I'm going to show you what that feels like and use that as a way to get you to remove them in Turkey. Currently, globally, now I'm paraphrasing, but it roughly goes like this for me as somebody who's a somewhat guilty Western white European Brit, let's say, that the British take is, um, it was necessary for us to be strong and safe and build our country's entire economic security, achieving massive military might. And we're like, well, how did you do that? Well, we took all your natural resources, we oppressed your people, and then once we got that resolved, we sort of worked out that in hindsight, we were a little bit naughty of us, but the good news is, um, we know we're all better now, and we have evolved. Technically, we're not supposed to say this out loud, but you really are being quite backwards by copying what we did then. Actually, we're starting to think that some of you are evil. Um, so because of that, we refuse to say sorry, ever, and because of what you're doing, we continue to wield military might, thinking we are somehow better. And you really need to listen to us. I once asked Mary Robinson, why, why don't we apologize? Why is an apology used as a diplomatic tool? And she very quickly said, well, you can't apologize for what you're still doing. I think it's ludicrous of us to believe that they should listen and collaborate with us now easily. Why would they? We are fighting, not connecting. We are on a vertical, competitive climb, not a lateral connect. And youth today work differently. Today is a world that sees strength in connecting. We actually just have to make that jump in trade and business. Trade is what gives every country its security. So if a country is unsafe, then it's connected to the trade of that country. And in today's world, we trade everywhere. And if any country is unsafe, a failed state, then mine is too. Al Gore told an African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Well, as individual countries, we've chosen fast over far, and now we're crashing as a result. So, maybe I should take over this. You see it all there, good. This is our definition. You've probably gotten more definition from Somali Marm and the others. Um, this is our mission. We're dedicated to the eradication of slavery through amplifying the victim's voice and supporting systemic solutions. And this is our strategy. We had to find a simple call to action, giving agency to every stakeholder, simple ask of companies, just tell us what you do. Spread decent work through the global supply chains. And we did that through using the transparency and supply chains law. So we need to find the sweet spot in our product supply chain that would be the catalyst to engage every stakeholder, i.e. every person on the planet, and create a race to the top around work best practices to reach the global workforce. We thought long and hard, and people kept saying to us over time that they really liked us, but they didn't quite understand what we did. And good old Humanity United gave us some money, put some faith in us, thank you. And we kept looking at it and looking at it, and then we decided that our strategy was just going to copy other people's great ideas. And we came across William Edwards Deming. Now, Deming was a World War II strategist, one of five strategists on behalf of the Allies. And what Deming said when we're overwhelmed with all these different things, that we, we can't see which, what do we do, what do we choose? He said, make weapons, make them better. And then when the Allies won, the Japanese copied his philosophy and they just looked in the supply chain. What's the weakest thing? What's the break point? And as American cars 
were not getting as many sales as, as Asian cars and Japanese cars, what they took it down to, the one thing they were doing was in their transmissions, if a part was supposed to be one foot long, plus or minus one eighth of an inch, the Japanese parts were all within one sixteenth of an inch. And this made Japanese cars run more smoothly, customers experienced fewer problems, and that one thing that they did ended up crashing the American car industry. So this is the supply chain. What do I mean by the supply chain? I mean the map that reveals the location of the global workforce, the places where we do the making of, the manufacturing, and the delivery mechanism, the retailing of our product. Farm to table, cotton mill to port, to ship, to truck, to factory, to truck, to store, to consumer. All we actually have to do is not ask other people to change, but show that we can change. And that's really exciting, because if we can see this, if this rings true at all, if we can feel it, we can change it. So, the California Transparency and Supply Chains Law is a consumer rights-driven disclosure bill. It requires the major manufacturers and retailers in California to go public on their policy on trafficking in humans and slavery. This bill, Umbrella's companies that trade of 100 million who have tax receipts in California. Now, if you're serious about eradicating in slavery and trafficking and all forms of forced labor from the supply chain, then you need to have best practices and standards that through process give the entire workforce decent work. Decent work takes place in environments where there are basic human rights. Lack of decent work often means lack of access to clean water or hospital or microcredit or an education or food or housing, making people vulnerable to enslavement and lesser forms of work violation. This transparency and supply chains law is a measuring tool that delivers the consumer the power to show companies we're going to support the decent choice. Justin Dillon from Slavery Footprint says this really well. We have gone from black market to gray market just to market. We all say working together is unrealistic and just too massive a headache. Business often says that's simply not going to happen, that's impossible. Well, if terrorists can do it, and if multi-billion dollar, the drug trade, the weapons trade, the people trade, any old illicit trade, increasingly legal trade, then I think so can we. We had several challenges. We're all Little hurdles like denial, secrecy, fear, feeling misunderstood, anger, ignorance, denial, complete abdication of responsibility, unbelievable cultural act. Did I say denial? Scathing criticism from our own camp, stubbornness around negative punitive terminology, clinging to past traumas, and denial. But the biggest piece that I think it boils down to is that in order for corporations to engage, they actually need to change their corporate structure the CEO, fiduciary, responsibility to shareholder, shareholder profits versus stakeholder value of a longer-term profit performance assessment. This is the crux of why raw materials are so low in price. So collectively, the competition has been driven out. Notice now we're doing things collectively, or just collectively, selectively. What I want to say is that throughout the supply chain, we don't have to change what we're doing. We can grow it by changing the corporate structure, you can still put in wells, just put it in around the workforce in the supply chain. You can still build hospitals, just change it and do it there. Micronutrients, all of it. The supply chain is a map. Our timeline has been taken over because the bill has already been copied. Arnold said this is a job killer. This is not a job killer, it's a lifesaver. Who picks up the cost? not necessarily the consumer, that's a myth. Fair trade is working with mango farmers in Haiti, improving their lapsed agricultural standards, earning them export quality produce that sells in Whole Foods supermarkets in the US. And even President Clinton has said that mango production could be the economy that pulls Haiti out of its troubles. We are underestimating the degree to which this is fundamental to reinvigorating consumer confidence and customer satisfaction. JFK, no man can fully grasp 
how far and how fast we have come. But condense, if you will, the 50,000 50, years of man's recorded history in a time span of but a half century. Stated in these terms, we know very little about the first 40 years. But then about 10 years ago, under the standards, man emerged from his cave to construct other kinds of shelter. Only five years ago, man learned to write and use a cart with wheels. Christianity began less than two years ago. The printing press came this year. And then less than two months ago, during his, this whole 50-year span of human history, the steam engine provided a new source of power. Newton explored the meaning of gravity. Last month, electric lights and telephones and automobiles and airplanes became available. Only last week did we develop penicillin and television and nuclear power. And now if America's new spacecraft succeeds in reaching Venus, we will have literally reached the stars before midnight tonight. And JFK ended his famous speech with a prophetic warning. This is a breathtaking pace, and such a pace cannot help but create new ills as it dispels old, new ignorance, new problems, new dangers. And Martin Luther King said, I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit together at the table of brotherhood. Now, I know that asking people to partner and I know there's a lot of people who've been tortured in this room and gone through horrible things. I find partnering torturous. So I'm going to put my... I know that that's putting us out of our comfort zone, so I'm going to really put myself out of my comfort zone. And I'm going to sing, because the song Amazing Grace was written by a former slave owner who erred and became enslaved himself. And then on release, he became a preacher. I have to have some water. <clears throat> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Thank you. I'm sorry I went over.